good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Replace Educational webinar. My name is Maud Everhart, and I'm working on the Replace project. So for those of you who are not uh, aware on this project, um, it is a scientific platform which aims at um, collecting the existing expertise on alternative methods to animal testing we have in Belgium, and this in one central database. So our series of educational webinars aims to put the existing expertise we have in the database in the spotlight. And the webinar of today will focus on uh, the planarians as a, an alternative in vivo models to assess developmental uh, neuro and genotoxicity. So before we actually start the webinar, I would like to give you a bit more practical information. So the two speakers of today will give their presentation uh, following each other and the Q&A uh, session will be at the end of their presentation. So in the meantime, if you have any question, you can ask them in the chat and I will um, ask them myself um, to the speaker at the end of the presentation. Um, also, all the webinars are uh, recorded and placed on our YouTube channel, so uh, it will be available in the week uh, in the weeks following this webinar. And um, also, important information: um, the webinars are accredited by the Flemish and Brussels region. So, for those of you who would like to receive a certificate of attendance, um, please put your name and email address in the chat, and we will provide these um, certificates in the coming weeks. So, um, I will now start the webinar. Um, so, first, I will introduce the two speakers. So, first, um, Dr. Caroline Bainens is a junior postdoctoral researcher um, at the Toxicology Group of the University of Hasselt. Her expertise is centered on understanding physiological responses to toxicological stressor. And over the past two years, she has put her focus on micro and nanoparticle induced uh, developmental toxicity. And to study the associated um, toxicological endpoints, she uses the planarian Schmittea Mediterranea as an alternative in vivo model. Our second speaker of today is Martijn Eleven. Um, he is a PhD student at the Bite Lab uh, research group at Hasselt University as well. Uh, he has a passion for microscopy and is dedicated to advancing regeneration studies through the application of cutting edge imaging techniques. As, and his focus lies in combining conventional imagi imaging techniques with real time imaging to study the role of redox and neuronal dynamics in vivo. And he is also committed to enhancing effective communications uh, within academia and beyond, advocating for accessible scientific knowledge across a diverse audience. So, Caroline Martin, uh, the floor is yours. So uh, thank you for the introduction. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining this webinar. Today, we would like to show you um, how planarians can be used in uh, developmental neurotoxicity and genotoxicity. So my name is Caroline Lelens. I'm a postdoctoral researcher uh, at Hasselt University. And together with Martijn Haleve, a PhD student from the same group, from the toxicology group, we will uh, talk about these fascinating creatures and their use in toxicity assessment. Um, so, as at the start of this presentation, I would like to introduce our research group. So, we are affiliated with Hasselt University, Campus Diepenbeek, and we are part of the Center for Environmental Sciences. Um, this center aims to address environmental problems of high societal urgency, uh, including pollution and climate change. And uh, the center is set up in a multidisciplinary manner. So this means that we uh, combine the expertise of different research groups. Um, and for example, uh, for our toxicological studies, we uh, mainly focus on uh, micro and nanoparticles recently because of their high uh, relevance today. Um, and 
these micro and nanoparticles that come with specific challenges. I will come back to this later on. But to tackle these cha challenges, um, we closely work together with other research groups. For example, we work with the chemistry department of our university um, to characterize the particles, but we also work closely together with Cienzano. So uh, Martin and I are both members of the BiteLab uh, research group. BiteLab stands for Biodiversity, Toxicology and Ecology. Um, uh, and we are members of the toxicology part. Um, this is led by Professor Karen Smeets. And the mission of uh, the toxicology group is to do uh, toxicity assessments um, in an integrated manner. Um, we investigate different types of pollutants, including pesticides, chemicals, heavy metals, and carcinogenic compounds. Um, and at this moment, we uh, focus or yeah, we put our focus on new emerging pollutants. So we um, we investigate mainly micro and nanoparticles because they are highly relevant today, and it fits within the mission of the Center for Environmental Sciences. So. Um, we try to make an integrated toxicity assessment of new emerging pollutants, and we do this by using alternative models. We use both in vivo models as in vitro models. For the in vitro models, um, we have uh, stem cell cultures, intestinal models, and we're also working towards um, organoids. For the in vivo models, we mainly use planarians as model organism. Um, and uh, as there is um, variation between, uh, between different species, uh, we also find it important to compare our results with other organisms. And we do this uh, via different consortia in which we are uh, participating. So today we will uh, focus or uh, talk about our research in planarians. Um, so who are we? Um, so my name is Caroline Benens. I'm a junior postdoctoral researcher in the toxicology group, and uh, I aim to understand complex physiological responses to toxicological stressors. And the latest two years, I worked on micro and nanoparticles, and I specifically focus on their effects on neuro and developmental toxicity. And I'm mainly uh, interested in the communication uh, between the different cells and different tissues, and thereby a focus on uh, redox molecules. Hi, my name is uh, Martijn Harriven. I'm a PhD student in the same lab as Caroline. Um, I'm currently in the third year of my PhD. Um, and during my PhD, I'm trying to uh, investigate the underlying mechanisms of regeneration. Um, I'm someone that's, someone that's fascinated by microscopy, and I'm trying to implement uh, cutting-edge cutting imaging techniques to advance uh, regeneration research. So I think we can say we both fell in love with the uh, cross-eyed cuteness of the planarians and uh, we are very excited to share uh, their unique properties and their use in toxicity testing with you. So um, as you probably know, uh, to understand co complex toxicological responses, uh, including cellular and tissue communication, we need full organism models. And there are already several available. For example, uh, the invertebrate model, uh, the elegance or the fruit fly, but also the early um, embryonic stages of, um, of zebra fish. And they all come with their own advantages and limitations. Um, and today I want to show you that, or we want to show you that um, planarians are also a good alternative full uh, model organism. So, um, they can be used for, uh, for, for um, the classical toxicity testing, for example, skin irritation and genotoxicity. But because they have very uh, unique properties, uh, we can also use them for more advanced toxicity testing. These unique properties, I will uh, come back to this later on, but I will also already tell you a little bit about them. Planarians, they are known for their high regenerative capacity. So it means that they can restore and repair any uh, damaged or missing body part, uh, cell, um, including their brain. Um, and 
This is the reason why planarians are often used in, in regeneration research and developmental, re developmental research. So we can use these planarians for assessing developmental toxicity and neurotoxicity. So um, together with these classical toxicity tests, we think um, planarians are an all-around toxicological model. Another advantage of planarians is that they are very interesting from an ecotoxicological point of view. And why is this? Well, in nature, planarians are found in uh, watery environments or terrestrial and environments. Um, and species that we use in the lab, Schmittia mediterranea, can also be found in nature. Um, and uh, it's a freshwater planarian, so it lives in fresh water. And um, planarians are um, benthic organisms. So they live in the benthic, so benthic zone of the uh, watery environment. And the benthic zone is the lowest part. Uh, it, uh, planarians glide over the surface. Um, they glide over the sediments. And this benthic zone is uh, an important, um, important zone uh, in the ecotoxicological point of view um, because uh, it, it was found that pollutants often sink to the bottom of a watery environment and accumulate in this benthic zone. They ac accumulate in the sediments. So, um, for example, uh, titanium dioxide nanoparticles, they are found in sunscreen. Uh, and it has been found that the concentration in the sediments is much higher than in the water, uh, water column. So these planarians, they glide over the sediments. Um, so they are exposed to higher concentrations than the animals in the water column. So this makes them um, this makes them interesting bioindicators to study um, uh, pollution. So before we dive deeper into uh, the specific toxicity assessments, I would like to introduce our planarian model uh, more in detail. So uh, planarians, they have a mucus layer that is surrounding their body. Uh, it helps them to glide over the surface and it protects them from the outside world. In addition, they have eyes, uh, they are called photoreceptors, and they are able to discriminate light uh, from dark and they prefer to be in the dark. In the middle of their um, uh, body, they have a pharynx, it's the planarian mouth. Uh, so it takes up the food and it distributes it further into the intestinal tract. And the intestinal tract is characterized by a lot of branches. In addition, the planarians, they have a central nervous system. Uh, and the central nervous system consists of a planarian brain, then uh, cephalic ganglia, and two ventral nerve cords. Those two ventral nerve cords, they are connected to each other uh, and connected to other structures uh, and are important for communication. Um, I already told you a little bit about uh, the unique properties of planarians, and I want to tell you a little bit more now. So, uh, as I said, planarians have a high regenerative capacity. This means that uh, the animals can actually uh, restore any lost or damaged body part, uh, including their central nervous system, without any functional loss, without any scar formation. So this is rather uh, unique in the animal uh, kingdom, and uh, they think they can do this uh, because they have a large pool of uh, adult stem cells. So on the picture here, you can see um, planarian, which was stains for the stem cells. Uh, so every dot you see is a stem cell, and uh, they estimate that approximately 30% of their body consists of uh, stem cells, which is a very high number. These stem cells are pluripotent, so it means that they can differentiate into any other cell type. They can differentiate in any cell type, including uh, cells for the central nervous system, so they can regenerate a brain, which is uh, very fascinating and impressive. So if we take a look at the right side, we see this highly regenerative capacity and this regeneration process more in detail. So we have a planarian that is cut in two pieces. So we cut the animals to artificially induce the developmental process. Um, and here we cut in two pieces, but actually we, cut, we can cut them in multiple pieces, two, three, four, and many pieces. 
and every piece will regenerate or develop uh, into a fully functional organism again. So the head fragments will grow the tissues that it's missing, so the tail, and we end up uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a fully functional organism. The tail will uh, regenerate the head, including the central nervous system, including the brain, that will end up in a fully functional organism again. So this regenerative uh, process, it all happens in only seven days, which is for me quite impressive. Um, so this uh, highly regenerative capacity together with these uh, large pool of pluripotent stem cells are characteristics that we use for the advanced toxicity testing. Uh, and we think that these unique properties uh, make planarians uh, a good alternative model organism to study different types of toxicity. So uh, within the following part of the presentation, we would like to uh, illustrate the different assays that we use for toxicological assessment. And um, we have the more classical tests like the skin irritation and genotoxicity test, but we also have the um, more advanced tests where we um, use the unique properties of the planarians to assess developmental toxicity and neurodevelopmental toxicity. We will illustrate these toxicity assays um, by showing data of our recent studies. And you will notice that we will mainly show data regarding nanoparticles, micro nanoparticles, because they are very relevant today. And because of that, I want to give a brief introduction about uh, micro and nanoparticles, why we are investigating them, what is what are the knowledge gaps, what are the challenges. So um, micro and nanoparticles, they are um, everywhere. They are in our day-to-day -day, uh, used um, used uh, products. Um, and um, well, we are not really sure if they are safe. So they are very small particles. They are very reactive, and we are not really sure if they are safe. And so there is a large need uh, for uh, toxicity assessment. And because, because they are that small, they are very reactive and they have special properties. Their surface versus volume ratio is, uh, is, is high. So it makes them very reactive and it makes that they react in a different way than chemicals. And this is uh, one of the challenges. Uh, and it's also one of the knowledge gaps we have um, that makes it difficult uh, to study nano, silver, micro nanoparticles uh, and why we need uh, toxicity assessment. So uh, we see that there are many different micro nanoparticles in um, our environment, for example, silver nanoparticles, titanium, uh, but also micro nanoplastics, polyethylene, uh, polystyrene, and so on. Uh, they have different sizes. They go from the micrometer size to the nanometer size. They come in different shapes, spheres, uh, or they have sharper edges, for example. They have different surface groups. Um, they can form agglomerates, ag aggregates. Their solubility can be uh, variable. So all these different things, we think that uh, they can uh, influence the toxicity response. So we need to... Uh, we need to know these things. So we, uh, we aim for an, um, an integrated toxicological uh, assessment. So we take these things, the physical chemical characterization into account. The second thing that we take into account uh, and that we need to know to understand what is happening is the particle fate. So based on these physical chemical characteristics, we think that the particle fate might be different. For example, we think that smaller particles can enter deeper into the tissue than uh, larger particles. So um, we combine these two, um, these, these two parameters to uh, understand the adverse outcome. And you will notice that in the presentation today, we will mainly talk about these adverse outcomes. We will not talk about the physical chemical characterization and the particle fate, but these things are also important to take into account while uh, assessing micro and nanoparticles. So uh, let me uh, explain you the skin irritation assay, the first uh, toxicity assay that we do in our lab. So while we assess um, different types of toxicity, we try to work towards an adverse outcome pathway. We try to work towards a very detailed understanding of the toxicity response. 
And um, we do this in a stepwise manner. We follow a specific uh, workflow. We go from, we assess um, toxicity at multiple levels. We go from the organismal level to the tissue level, to the cellular level, to the uh, molecular level. Uh, and at the same time, we also try to look at communication, um, cell cell communication, tissue communication, to see how this is all related. And um, here you can see uh, an example of uh, the workflow we follow to assess skin irritation. So we start by the by the more organismal effect, then we work towards the molecular effects to get uh, a detailed understanding of what is happening. So for the, for the skin irritation assessment so far, we first start by investigating the in vivo mucus production, then we quantify the mucus production, and then we identify the involved cell types to get a better understanding of what, hap what is happening. Uh, and we aim to work towards an adverse outcome pathway, but we still need some steps in between. So let me show you uh, the visualization, visualization of the in vivo mucus production. So um, we follow the animals in real time in vivo. Um, and here you see animals that, an animal that is uh, exposed to silica nanoparticles, and you see that there is an increased mucus production. We can quantify this mu mucus production, and therefore we developed an assay um, that does this um, based on the flure on fluorescence. So we have uh, the planarians, they are um, placed in a petri dish. There's medium inside with the titanium dioxide nanoparticles. The planarians, they glide over the surface of the um, petri dish and they will produce mucus in response to the um, silica, titanium uh, dioxide nanoparticles. So we isolate this mucus, we collect it, we uh, spin it down, and then we stain the mucus with a specific staining that is fluorescent and we measure the fluorescence intensity. So we see that after titanium dioxide nanoparticle exposure, the fluorescent intensity uh, is increased, which suggests um, skin irritation. An alternative method, we fix the animals and we make thin slices uh, to stain them uh, to visualize the mucus. Uh, so um, here, for example, we we make um, we fix the animal and we make transversal sections and we stain the uh, sections and we look into the region that is close to the pharynx in this uh, case and we see in blue the uh, mucus layer that is stained and we see that this is uh, thicker in the titanium dioxide exposed animals and in the control animals and by measuring the thickness of this um, layer we can have a quantification of the mucus thickness. A next step would be to identify the affected cell types leading to a more detailed understanding of a toxicity response and this can for example be done by histological examination of the tissue or cell uh, specific staining. Um, and a, set, a second assay that we uh, use allows us to assess genotoxicity using canarians. And again, here we follow a similar um, workflow. So we go from the organismal level to a more, uh, to a more detailed level, molecular level. Um, so first, we classify the compounds in specific groups. We classify them as non-carcinogens non-genotoxic carcinogens and genotoxic carcinogens. Then we confirm genotoxicity by using the standard genotoxicity assays that are also possible in planarians, for example, uh, the COMET assay. And then as a third step, we are of course interested in the underlying mechanisms. Uh, so we uh, investigate this further in detail to uh, aim for an adverse outcome pathway. So, um, this um, group-specific classification of, um, of, of carcinogens um, is an assay that we developed in our lab. Um, so it's based on stem cell perforation patterns. Um, stem cells are very sensitive and they react to stress. And we use the stem cell perforation patterns of these animals to assess uh, uh, genotoxicity. 
So how does the assay work? Well, we have an animal, we expose them to the uh, compound of interest. Then at specific time points, we, um, we, we fix samples uh, and we stain the, the uh, proliferation we stain the proliferating stem cells. Um, so every orange dot you see here um, are uh, proliferating stem cells. And based on the um, on the specific patterns that I will explain in the next slide, based on the specific patterns, we can discriminate between uh, between non-carcinogens, genotoxic carcinogens, and non-genotoxic carcinogens. So let me uh, explain these patterns more in detail. So what we actually do is we stain or we, um, yeah, we, we stain the, um, the, the proliferating stem cells at two, at two different time points. These two different time points are one day and three days after amputation. And uh, why did we choose these two time points? Well, they are very important in uh, planarian um, stem cell dynamics. They are very important in the stem cell, uh, in the planarian development. So they are actually uh, they actually mark two uh, major bursts of uh, stem cell proliferation, um, and um, we have discovered that um, depending on the compound, um, that these stem cell proliferation patterns um, are different. For example, for the genotoxic carcinogens, we see a decrease in the number of mitotic stem cells when we compare one day and three days, while for the non-genotoxic compounds, we see an increase. For the genotoxic compounds, these are compounds that um, directly induce uh, DNA damage. Uh, we think that uh, this DNA damage uh, puts these uh, stem cells into cell cycle arrest. Uh, which explains the drop into mitotic uh, cells. For the non-genotoxic carcinogens, the damage is induced by alternative and indirect ways. So we think that the stem cells react in a compensator compensatory manner, um, probably uh, an explanation for the increase in stem cell proliferation. So in the next step, we confirm genotoxicity using classical um, genotoxicity assays, so similar to other organisms, the comet assay can also be used in uh, planarians. So um, it's to assess DNA damage. So uh, in our assay, we dissociate the planarian tissue so that we end up with individual, individual, individual cells. Uh, they are subjected to a migratory field, and um, the more fragmented or damaged the DNA gets, the further it will migrate. So the more damage, the larger the tail of the comet. And there we see that genotoxic carcinogens have a, a larger tail compared to the non-carcinogens and non-genotoxic carcinogens. Of course, uh, we want to look into more detail to understand the complex uh, toxicological mechanisms. So we aim to identify the underlying mechanism. And we can do this in several ways, um, but here we chose to do uh, this based on a large omics-based screening. And as an example, I want to show you um, cadmium. Cadmium is a heavy metal, it's uh, carcinogenic, and when we expose uh, worms to cadmium, they, um, they will develop tumors. Um, so, and we wanted to know what was underlying this. So, um, we aimed to find the underlying mechanisms. We did this by a large proteomic screening. So, we compared control animals with uh, cadmium exposed animals. Um, we ended up with a list of different differentially expressed proteins. And based on literature and known databases, we made a specific selection of targets that we wanted to um, look into more detail. So uh, below, you can see what it looked like uh, from a real result. So we had differentially expressed proteins between cadmium and control animals. Um, and two of them uh, we investigated more in detail, the tumor suppressor genes MMPB and Clipper. There are two uh, tumor suppressor genes that were uh, decreased in the cadmium-exposed worms compared to the control. So in the next step, 
we tried to find a causal relationship between cadmium tumor formation and the reduced expression of the tumor suppressor genes. Uh, and I will show you how we did this using MMPB, one of the targets here. So what we did is we used RNA interference. It uh, knocks down or decreases the expression of our gene of interest, so MMPB. Uh, so in this example, we interfered with the um, expression of MMTB, and this resulted in several abnormalities. So you can see these abnormalities here in a head fragment, a trunk fragment, and a tail fragment. And these are all the different abnormalities that we observed. Um, so in all the fragments, we see um, these abnormalities. You see blisters in the head region, um, but you also see tissue outgrowths um, near the pharynx or in other parts of the worms, for example. We, um, we um, looked into these tissue outgrowths more in detail to see if we can learn a little bit more. And yes, we could learn a little bit more because in these um, tissue outgrowths, stem cells and proliferating stem cells were present. Um, so this gave, gave us a deeper understanding uh, of the different causal relationships between the different events and players um, for uh, cadmium. And uh, the third and fourth toxicity assay we would like to discuss use the rather unique pro properties of planarians. Um, and Martijn will discuss these assays uh, in more detail. Okay, thank you, Karin. Um, so, like Karin already told you, um, the planarian has a lot of pluripotent adult stem cells um, and can regenerate very quickly within 7 to 14 days, which includes a fully functional nervous system. And because of these characteristics, it's a very interesting and good proxy for development. So, if we look at how we um, assess um, developmental toxicity, we also do this in a stepwise manner. Um, so first, we will start with a broader screening and look uh, or investigate the effects uh, of a certain toxicant on tissue development. Next, we want to identify if there might be an effect on certain stem cell dynamics. Uh, and of course, if you want to work towards an adverse outcome pathway, we will pinpoint the molecular details and uh, search which uh, molecular pathways or signaling events are affected. Um, so, if one, we want to investigate uh, the effects uh, on tissue growth, then we always induce regeneration by amputating the animal. So, on the left, you can see that we cut an animal in two parts, and this generates a regenerating head and a regenerating tail. And if you focus on the uh, head, you can see that it's regrowing uh, a new tail, and the head will regrow a new uh, the tail, sorry, will regrow a new head. And the arrow and the dotted line indicates uh, the newly formed tissue, which we call the blastema. And the blastema is a white, unpigmented mass of undifferentiating cells that are um, starting to replace um, the lost or damaged body structures. Um, and to investigate effects on tissue growth, we want to um, measure this or quantify this. And to do this, we measure the size of the blastema and compare it to the total uh, body surface of the animal. And on the right, on the right, you can see a, a graph in which, uh, which shows data where we uh, expose planarians to a new emerging pollutant, namely um, plastic uh, nanoparticles. And you can see that compared to the control, both the head and the tail um, had affected uh, tissue growth. So the blastema size was reduced compared to the control. So if we if we uh, see effects on the on the level of the organism, let's say, the next thing we want to do is investigate if a certain toxicant can also uh, induce effects on stem cell dynamics. So we can look at the total stem cell number. We can look at the amount of uh, cells that are dividing or undergoing mitosis. But we can also look at um, the stem cells that are differentiating towards, for example, an intestinal cell or a nerve cell. So then we have three different stainings for this. Uh, we can 
quantify the staining so we can count the amount of cells that are dividing or proliferating for example but we can also uh, measure the intensity of each pixel within a given area so both can really uh, give interest interesting results but next to that we can also focus on certain patterns so if you focus on the green hat uh, in the top of the slide you can see um, that the lower part is where the wound uh, was induced. And normally we expect that stem cells proliferate and migrate towards the wound site. So if we see uh, differences in these patterns, this might indicate that there, there is also an underlying effect. So uh, when, we uh, when we see uh, an underlying effect, like in this example, for example, here you can see again, um, an organism that is exposed to these plastic nanoparticles. And the upper part shows uh, the total stem cell number and the lower part shows the stem cells that are, that are proliferating. And in the graph on the right, you can see that um, within the heads or the heads that are exposed to the plastic nanoparticles, their uh, stem cell prolifer proliferation is significantly affected. And this you can also see if we just look at the picture of the orange heads, let's say, so the orange staining where the proliferating stem cells are stained, you can see that when they are exposed to the particles, we see, um, yeah, not as much dividing stem cells as in the control. So after we identified effects on the level of the organism, but also on the level of the stem cell dynamics, we want, of course, to know something more about um, the molecular signature that is affected. And for this, we often want to look at molecules that are very important uh, for, for the communication between cells, between tissues, but also within cells. And for this, um, uh, I will give an example today about redox uh, molecules, because we know that redox molecules are very important in a lot of biological processes, but also um, they, but they pay, sorry, <clears throat> but they also play a big role in a lot of toxicity responses. So the redox balance consists of two parts. We have the pro-oxidative part with the redox, uh, with the reactive oxygen species, and we have the antioxidant part with, for example, uh, SODs and hudeptyin and catalase, for example. So we know that if we cut an animal, that at the amputation site, a rust burst will occur. So if a rust burst burst occurs at the wound site, regeneration is initiated and the animal can regrow its head, for example, and regrow new eyes. But when we block this ROS burst, there is no ROS present at the amputation site and regeneration is severely affected. So you can see a reduced blastema site, size or a reduced uh, newly formed tissue. And you can also see that no eyes are formed. And when we see similar effects, uh, after we ex expose um, the animal to a certain particle, let's say, then we, for us, it's then logical uh, to scan if a certain part particle can induce alterations uh, in the redox balance. And because these are very important signaling molecules um, uh, between cells and between tissues. But um, it's not easy to capture these molecules but because they are very uh, reactive and uh, highly dynamic in nature. So uh, this can be challenging. Uh, so what do we need? We need an immobilization method where we can image the animal uh, while it's still uh, living. So we can image them in vivo. But as you can imagine, when you have a living animal, of course, uh, the animal itself will move because it's it's alive, uh, like we humans, we also tend to move when we are alive. Um, and also, even if you can immobilize uh, the animal, the insides is like more watery or gel-like, and the insides also tend to move a little bit. So um, you can use a lot of uh, methods to uh, anesthetize um, the animal. For example, and a lot of or model organisms, they use ethanol or chlorotones to uh, immobilize the planarian, but they are still invasive. They have a neurotoxic effect, for example. So there is a need for a non-invasive immobilization method. So for that, we developed a newly uh, or a novel 
uh, immobilization method, where we place the animal in a, a microscopic slide uh, with three chambers. And in the middle chamber, we uh, position the animal and we'll place a little droplet of low melting point agarose of 7% and the rest of the chamber will be filled with 2.5% low melting point agarose. On top, we apply a little layer of medium so that we prevent um, prevent that the, the low melting point agarose will dry out during um, imaging, for example. And on the sides, you can see that the uh, chambers on the sides are filled with little ice cubes. And this is uh, to uh, make sure that the animal will not move anymore because uh, when we apply uh, cold temperatures to the animal, um, movement is very limited. So the combination of the low melting point agarose with the ice and this imaging setup allows us to image um, in vivo um, in real time. And this uh, gives a lot of more uh, and this gives us a lot, of, lot more information about uh, dynamic signaling events, uh, such as uh, reactive oxygen species, for example. So at this moment, we are able uh, to image uh, different parts of the redox balance in our lab. So we can image superoxide, but also hydrogen peroxide. Um, and we are also able to uh, visualize glutathione in living animals. Um, at first sight, you see that these stainings mostly stain the intestinal tract, but if we zoom in uh, more, you can see, for example, with the superoxide staining, that it's present within the epidermis, and you can even see it at the cellular level where it's located and present. For the glutathione, uh, we see that it's mostly present within the intestinal tract, but you can see that uh, it's present within different regions. Uh, so we can really use these stainings to say something about signaling events uh, in real time in a living animal. Okay, um, so that was the part of the neurodevelopmental toxicity. Now I will say something more about the neurotoxicity because these animals uh, have the capacity to regenerate the, their uh, total central nervous system within 7 to 14, day, 14 days, which is very unique within the animal kingdom. And if we combine both um, toxicity assays, we can, of course, say something more about the neurodevelopmental toxicity. So um, to assess neurotoxicity in planarians, we do it in the same manner. So we will have a stepwise approach. Uh, first, we investigate alterations in behavior after exposure. Secondly, we'll, we will identify overall effects on the central nervous system, and um, then we will go delve a little bit deeper and uh, investigate if certain neuronal populations might be affected to, in the end, uh, work again towards an adverse outcome pathway. So, um, first of all, um, we start with investigating behavior, and in the left corner, you can see a normal uh, planarian that's moving uh, and it moves through its beating cilia on the ventral side. Um, and this depends on nerve signaling, of course. Um, and when uh, movement is affected by um, a toxicant or a particle that can induce neurotoxicity, we often see very strange behaviors. For example, they can have this C shape, they can start curling or can start scrunching, which is uh, moving in a snail-like manner. Um, but next to these phenotypes uh, we see within the movement, uh, we also in general see an effect on locomotion, so the movement of the animal. So the animal will move very slow or not at all. And that, that effect on the movement we can quantify. So we can quantify it in two uh, ways. We can do the motility assay. And this is an essay where we just count the amount of lines the animal is able to cross within a, uh, within a certain period of time. And the second one is the light avoidance essay. Light avoidance essay. And if you remember, uh, Caroline already told you that the planarian has two photoreceptors, which we often call the eyes. Um, but in the end, it's not really eyes. It's like the photoreceptors. And in this way, they can react to st stimuli such as light, for example. Um, they are photophobic, so they tend to move away from light in a normal situation. When we know that the nerves or nervous system might be affected, we expect 
that they cannot move uh, away from light in the same manner or the same speed. So in this essay, we will um, count the amount of time it takes for the animal to move away from the lightest quadrant to the darkest quadrant. And we um, also count how long uh, the animal stays in the most darkest spot. Um, so next to overall effects on behavior, we also know that specific uh, or that specific behavior is often related to an effect on a very specific neurotransmitter. So on the left, you see again a control animal that's moving very smoothly along the surface. And in the middle, you will see a movie of uh, animals where dopamine signaling is affected. And these animals tend to move very slowly, but also uh, they move while shaking. Um, on the right, uh, I have an example of how an animal looks after uh, interfering with serotonin signaling. For this, I did not take a movie for today because I want to point out how the phenotype looks. And as you can see, the arrows indicate the place where the eye should be. Um, and we know that if we interfere with serotonin signaling, that um, the animal is not able to form uh, pigment within the eyes. So this is really characteristic for uh, interference with serotonin signaling. So um, if we see these effects on the level of the organism, then of course we want to uh, delve a little bit deeper because we expect maybe to see effects on the level of the central nervous system. So, not, so on the left, you see again a control animal with a nicely developed brain uh, with two brain lobes and the ventral nerve cords. And if you want to identify effects on the development of the central nervous system or the, uh, um, the health of the central nervous system, let's say, then we can quantify this. So we can measure um, the width of the brain. So it's the width of the two uh, brain lobes or the ganglia. And we divide this uh, um, by the head width. And in this way, we can quantify um, how healthy the brain is or how, how good the brain developed after an exposure to a toxicant, for example. On the right, you see that uh, when an animal is exposed to silver nanoparticles during regeneration, that first of all, the brain lobes are not nicely developed, so they are way smaller, and there is no connection between the brain lobes. Um, then in the lower part, you see um, a zoomed in picture of the ventral nerve cords and the tail that are not connecting. And that is also after um, chemical inhibition of a certain compound. This is just to illustrate that we have uh, also a, a qualitative way uh, to measure effects on the central nervous system. So if we see overall effects on the central nervous system, of course, the next step is to characterize if there is an effect on certain neuronal populations to really work towards that adverse outcome pathway. So there are two ways in which we can do this. One way is to just look uh, at all the neuronal populations. So we then, or the most important ones, let's say. So we then do a broader screening. At this moment, we are able to visualize serotonergic, octopaminergic, dopaminergic, GABAergic, and peptidergic neurons. Um, so uh, we can just look at the amount of cells that are present after um, exposure, but we can also uh, look at patterns again, because these neurons uh, or neuronal cell bodies uh, are always present in a specific pattern. Um, and we can look at different time points during regeneration, of course. And next to that, um, we can also, um, so next to that, we can also <clears throat> quantify it by measuring intensity, of course. Um, but the second way in which we can do this is if we see that um, there is a specific behavior, for example, no eyes are formed, then um, it's more convenient to just uh, screen for an effect at serotonergic neurons, because this is a little bit expected uh, based on what we see uh, at the level of the organism. So next to uh, just um, 
staining all these neuronal populations and look at the effects. We can also stain neuronal progenitor cells, which is also very interesting, especially if we co localize them with stem cell markers, because in this way, we can say which stage of neuronal development is affected by a certain toxicant, which gives a lot of more information, um, especially about uh, neural development in general, let's say. Um, so what's next? What's the future for uh, planarian toxicity research? Um, of course, we want to go towards um, assessing an integrated toxicity response. Um, so if you imagine that you have a certain particle, for example, a nanoparticle, the nanoparticle gets uh, taken up, then the cells will communicate to each other and the tissues will, tissues will communicate. So regarding the cell-cell communication, the planarian community is now identifying more and more uh, glial cells, which are the supportive cells of the neurons. So in this, way, in this way, we will be able to say something more about cellular communication between glial cells and neurons and how this is affected after exposure. Um, and then at the tissue level, if you want to uh, study tissue communication, for example, if particles are taken up in the intestinal tract and you want to see how this can maybe um, get into the nervous system and have an effect, then we, we need to go towards, uh, or then we need to look at signal transduction because that's how these um, systems communicate. And for this, we need real-time imaging. I showed you a new immobilization method, but um, we are now currently um, optimizing this method uh, to use it for a light sheet microscopy, because in this way, we can really uh, study signal transduction in a living animal in a three-dimensional way, which is a, a lot, which gives a lot of added value because at the moment um, we are looking in a two-dimensional way and a three-dimensional way, of course, gives, gives a lot of more information, um, especially if you want to look at tissue communication. And lastly, uh, we want to work um, towards an adverse outcome pathway for certain compounds or a range of compounds. So that's why we are also optimizing uh, protocols to do the localizations of interactions at the ultrastructural level um, with correlative light electron microscopy. So to summarize a little bit, the goal or the aim is to go towards an integrated toxicity response. So if we have a new emerging pollutant, we start with um, determine, determine uh, or looking at organismal effects like uh, the phenotype, behavior, eye formation, how tissue development is affected. Next, we delve a little bit deeper and look how uh, tissue formation is affected. So we can look at how the nervous system uh, is developing. We can look at how intestinal tract is developing. And what's very interesting is that we can also look at tissue communication. So if the intestinal uh, tract is affected or the nervous system is affected, how will this have an effect on the development of the intestinal tract? And in the end, we want to go to the cellular effects and the molecular effects. But at this point, um, the conventional imaging methods or the use of the conventional imaging methods results in uh, information that's lost um, because we still take snapshots in time after exposure. So we can never really see the first seconds of exposure. So that's why we need real-time imaging, like I mentioned before, to image in vivo during exposure or uh, even seconds after exposure. And this way we can say a lot more about cell communication and about, um, and in this way we can, of course, um, go towards the integrated toxicity assessment from the first moment of exposure until lighter uh, until later uh, times after exposure. Uh, and to give an example, uh, Karin will now um, talk about a case study, how we are doing the research regarding silver nanoparticle exposure. Thank you, Martijn. Um, so we will illustrate this integrated toxicity assessment using silver nanoparticle exposures. And here I would like to show you two uh, things 
we haven't talked about before. Uh, first, the physical chemical characterization. So we use um, physical chemical characteristics of the particles to understand their toxicity. So we look into their size, the agglomeration behavior. We measure several parame parameters such as hydrodynamic di diameter, theta potential, and so on to understand how these uh, particles uh, are characterized. Um, a second thing we haven't talked about is their particle fate. Um, so uh, we look into where particles are located, are they taken up by cells, are they transported? And uh, for the silver nanoparticles, we know that they are taken up by the epidermis and by the intestinal tract. Uh, and we combine this information with the physical chemical characterization to understand the adverse outcomes. Um, and to illustrate this, uh, the adverse outcomes are, uh, are measured at different uh, levels. So the organismal uh, effects, they show that silver nanoparticles uh, result in abnormal movement of the, um, of the animal. So they show a, a, a scrunching behavior. Um, this is abnormal. On top of that, silver nanoparticles induce uh, um, defects in whole body regeneration. So you see that the uh, outgrowth, the tissue outgrowth, it's, it's much, much smaller in silver nanoparticle exposed rooms compared to controls. Also, their eye development is affected. So they have faint eyes or no eyes at all. And together with this uh, strange behavior, this um, we think it's uh, linked to um, neurotoxicity, neurodevelopmental toxicity. So at the tissue level, we uh, looked at the central nervous system. We looked at brain development. So a normal brain um, develop, normal uh, brain development shows two brain um, halves with a connection between both. And after silver nanoparticle exposure, we see that the brains are much smaller uh, and the connection is not formed or that there are no brains at all. Um, Underlying at the cellular level, we um, looked at stem cell dynamics and we found that silver nanoparticles, um, they, um, they uh, reduce stem cell proliferation and differentiation. Uh, and then on the next step, we, look, we try to look at uh, which neurons are affected. So at this moment, we have these effects on movement that we see, and we think this is linked to effects on the dopam dopaminergic neurons or the serotonergic neurons. So we are currently looking into this. Um, and in several organisms, the central nervous system is linked to the intestinal tract. And because we saw that uh, silver nanoparticles can be taken up by the intestinal tract, we are looking if there is uh, a link between both, if there is a connection, if there is communication between both. In addition, we saw that silver nanoparticles affect the planarian microbiome, so the composition is different after silver nanoparticle ex exposure. And we're also looking into this, the microbiome, uh, the communication with the uh, intestinal tract and the central nervous system. So we went from the organismal uh, level to the tissue level to the cellular level, and now we want to know uh, what is really happening in, uh, in a detailed manner. So we want to know at the molecular level which processes are affected. And we found that um, there is DNA damage after uh, silver nanoparticle exposure, and we think this is related to reactive oxygen species. And we are currently investigating a specific um, pathway, the MAP kinase pathway, um, to see. Um, if uh, there is a link with the silver nanoparticle ex exposures. So uh, the MAP kinase pathway is a very important pathway in development and in neurodevelopment. So in this way, we try to um, understand uh, silver nanoparticle toxicity in a very detailed way. So to conclude, planarians allow full organism in vivo ecotoxicological studies. They capture the toxic response in real time, and they are an alternative model to assess developmental neurodevelopment developmental and genotoxicity. And um, we hope we have convinced you that planarians are an all-round toxicological model. And to end this presentation, I would like to acknowledge um, all previous and current members of the toxicology group. And if you uh, would like to collaborate, um, please contact us.
you uh, both of you for your nice presentation. It's very nice to see uh, all the applications uh, of this, uh, this alternative in vivo model and the broad possibilities it can offer. Um, so now we can move on to the questions. Um, and I already saw that there are some in the chat. Um, so the first one um, is for you, Martijn. Um, did you check what the impact is on the immobilization process itself on oxidative stress markers? Yeah, um, very interesting question. Um, um, we optimized or developed the method specifically to um, visualize, for example, reactive oxygen species in the most non-invasive manner. So um, if we create wounds, of course, uh, reactive oxygen species are induced and there is an effect. But if we have a method like this, it's non-invasive. So we expect that it does not have a big effect on these oxid oxidative stress markers. It might have a little effect. I think uh, if we put a planarian or an animal in such a position, uh, it of course has always a little effect. Um, but compared to the other methods that are currently used and way more invasive in terms or of uh, neurotoxicity, for example, like chloroton or ethanol. Um, it's uh, very limited, let's say. Um, and still, if you take uh, the, the controls with you, you, can al you should always be able to compare. And even if the method induces a little bit more oxidative stress, then still, if you uh, look at, for example, uh, the effect of silver nanoparticles on um, reactive oxygen species, you sh should still be able to see that because, of course, the control will um, uh, will have the same uh, immobilization method, let's say. On the other hand, I have to say, uh, microscopy on itself will also have an effect um, on uh, oxidative stress, so we also always have to take that into account. Um, also with interpreting uh, interpreting results, um, but I think for this non-invasive method, um, the induced oxidative stress is quite limited, especially compared to other more invasive methods. Okay. Um, then the second question is. Uh... So the toxicity of compounds is depending on the dose. So are you able to identify those dependent effects? Um, so maybe I can answer that question. So if we do um, toxicological screenings, we usually start by doing dose response curves uh, and we, we, we try to see where the, the lethal um, dose is. Um, so we usually start with these dose response curves um, and uh, then we, we, we use environmentally relevant concentrations to assess uh, the toxicity. And usually we compare multiple, um, multiple concentrations, for example, a lower concentration with a higher concentration uh, to see the different effects. Um, and we indeed see uh, some we see um, differences in effect. Uh, the severity can depend, uh, for example, the um, severity of the um, tissue outgrowths, uh, the quantification of the plasma sizes. You can see uh, sometimes concentration dependent effects. Okay. Um, and then this, the the other question is: Have you? performed any studies on how the surface chemistry influences the different types of toxicity. So, for example, um, argent nanoparticles of the same size and shape, but with different ligand shells. And would you say that these studies should be performed not only on the whole particle, so, for example, particle plus ligand shell, but also on the ligand molecule molecules themselves? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question, and maybe I can give the example of our uh, study regarding silver nanoparticles. So there we actually compared um, uh, non-coated silver nanoparticles with coated uh, silver nanoparticles. They were um, PPP-coated particles, uh, and we saw that there were differences in uh, the responses. So in, in the end, we concluded that PPP-coated uh, silver nanoparticles 
had a more severe effect on uh, behavior and on the um, um, on the neuronal damage. Um, and um, yeah, I think it, it would be a good idea to also uh, um, yeah to to include the, the, sur the surface uh, compounds as well in the toxicity study. All right. Um, then I don't see any other question in the chat. Um, so before we end the webinar, I would like to thank all the participants for attending uh, this webinar session and thank you as well to the speakers for your very interesting presentation. Um, I would like to remind you that if you need a certificate of attendance, uh, you can put your email address and uh, and name in the chat, um, and we will provide you the certificate in the coming weeks. And uh, regarding the recording, it will be posted soon on our YouTube channel. And also, if you are interested to present your work during these educational webinars, or if you have suggestions regarding the topics, uh, other topics to explore during um, coming webinars, uh, don't hesitate to indicate it um, in the survey that will be available just when you close this webinar. So thank you everyone, and I hope to see you during uh, the next uh, webinar sessions. See you.